new series today. Let's jump into the message. Uh, a few months ago, I, uh, I heard about this podcast called How I Built This with Guy Raz. And so this interviewer, Guy Raz, he, uh, he's from NPR. And in his podcast, he talks with some of the innovators behind some of the world's best known companies. And so I've listened to several episodes so far, but it's kind of cool to hear the backstories of these now famous companies. Like, how did they get started? And so I was, I was listening to some of them, and one of them that jumped out was uh, I was listening to the story behind Airbnb. And it was kind of cool how it got started. The idea for this started when this guy, uh, his, his rent got raised by like 25%. And so he, he wasn't sure how he's going to pay for his rent. He was struggling to pay for it. And so one day while he was walking uh, through the Bay Area, he saw all the like hotels had these no vacancy signs because there was an event coming to town. And so he was like, well, I wonder... And so he decided to post online for this next convention that was coming to the Bay Area. Hey, if you want a place to stay at my apartment, uh, I'll rent out, like you can sleep on air mattresses for like 80 bucks a night. And people did it. They, they took up his air mattresses, and he, he said that uh, the first night that people stayed at this house, he, like, went into his room to go to sleep, and he's like, what did I just do? Like, I have these strangers in my house. They could murder me. They could rob me. And so uh, he, he was a little concerned. He thought, this is a bad idea. But then he went out, and he started talking with the people who were staying at his place, and he, and he just loved the experience. And so that was kind of like the origin story of Airbnb. Now, and it took years and years for it to actually, like, take off and there were a lot of ups and downs, but Airbnb now has more listings than the top five hotel brands combined, and it's worth more than the top three largest hotel chains combined. But again, it started with some air mattresses in a small apartment in the Bay Area. Isn't that crazy? Origin stories are important, aren't they? They kind of help us understand why things are the way they are today. So this morning, we're starting, we're starting a rather long series called In the Beginning, and it kind of correlates with my beginning here at, at the church. Uh, but we're going to be looking in this series at some incredible beginnings, some incredible origin stories that we read about in Scripture. These beginnings, though, have far-reaching implications for us today. These, these beginnings these, these origins, we, we need to understand them so we can understand why things are the way they are today and really what that means for us today. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app, you can turn to the very first page of Scripture, Genesis chapter 1. And I want to take us way back, all the way back to the very beginning, before time even existed, before time was created And these are the opening words of Scripture in Genesis 1-1. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Can we read that together? We'll have it on the screen. Ready? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so today what I want to do is I want to take a look at this very first verse of the Bible. And actually, I just want to look at the first four words of this verse. In the beginning, God Some of you are thinking, Steve, you said this was going to be a rather long series, but if we're only taking four words at a time, (laughs) that's going to be really, yeah, Uh, that's what we're doing. No. Um, In these first four words, though, in the beginning, God, we see right away that the Bible assumes the existence of God. The Bible assumes the existence of a God. But is that something we can assume today? I mean, come on, we, we live in like 2021, right? Haven't we outgrown these ancient words like we have science today to show us that there's no God, right? And listen, listen to some of these statements by some incredibly intelligent men. Carl Sagan said, The cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, said, The factual premise of religion, the God hypothesis, is untenable. He said, God almost certainly does not exist. So how can we be confident that God actually exists when there are some really, really smart people telling us that we're a bunch of idiots to believe this stuff? In fact, I don't know if you saw this in the news lately, but just a a few weeks ago, uh, I heard about how Harvard University, their uh, organization of chaplains just elected Greg Epstein as their chief of chaplains. Chief of chaplains. He's going to oversee 40 university chaplains on campus at Harvard. Greg Epstein is the author of the book Good Without God, and he is a well-known atheist. So an atheist is the chief of chaplains at Harvard University. 
So this highly respected university is basically saying, even if you're re religious, you, you really shouldn't believe in God, though. So are we foolish to believe in God? Is this belief in God just like wishful thinking? Is it a blind leap of faith? Or are we, as the Apostle Peter instructed us in 1 Peter 3.15, are we prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope that we have? And so this morning as we start this series off, I want to preach a very, very different message. Um, and none of the other messages in the series are going to be like this. So kind of hang with me today. But for today's message, I'm going to lean heavily into an area of theology called apologetics. The word apologetics it derives from the Greek word apologia, and it means a reasoned defense. So this branch of theology is basically about defending the Christian faith. It's not about apologizing, okay? It's about defending the Christian faith. So now and then, you're, as I preach throughout the years, you're going to hear me throw in some things into my sermon that will help us defend the faith. Sometimes I'll preach a whole sermon that's apologetic related. I might even have a whole series that's apologetic related. I remember one time I was preaching a sermon uh, that was helping Christians understand the issue of evolution and the differences between micro and macro evolution and why we believe the Bible and why it's reasonable to believe the Bible. And after I preached this sermon, this little old man came up to me and he, he said, Steve, I just got to tell you, that was really boring. <laughs> and so uh, after I punched him in the face, um, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, after, after he had come up and told me he didn't really like the sermon, I had several college students and high school students come up to me and they were thanking me for that sermon. In fact, one of them asked if, if I would send him a copy of that sermon. And, and I think the reason there was a disconnect between these two groups of people uh, was for this older gentleman he grew up in a generation where, where, that, that just accepted the Bible. Like, you, you know, it's the whole, if the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. But these young people, they were being bombarded each and every day with skepticism and people blasting them for their belief in God, for their faith. And they were so thankful to hear that it's not just reasonable to believe in the God of the Bible, but there is actual evidence to support it. So before I present some of the, the points, the reasons I think that point to God's existence, let me, let me just tell you one answer I don't think is going to work very well with people who are skeptical. And, and it's going to sound very strange hearing this from a, from a pastor. But when it comes to unbelievers and skeptics, giving the answer, well, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it, probably is not going to work very well with them. Now trust me, I love the Bible. I love it. In fact, one of my degrees is a Bachelor of Arts in Bible. Okay, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. But if we want to help our friends with their doubts and with their questions, we need to start with where they are, not with where we are, right? Yes, we, we need to know the Bible. And yes, we ought to apply what the Bible says to our lives. But if others don't see Scripture as authoritative, we might actually be more persuasive if we appeal to sources that they already trust in. Things like science and reason and even personal experience. So today that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at several compelling reasons that we can be confident that God exists. They're based in science, philosophy, and in personal experience. So let's look at the first one based in science. The first one is this. The beginning of the universe points to God as its originator. The beginning of the universe points to God as its originator. So the first reason to believe in God is based on a branch of science called cosmology. It's the study of the origin, structure, and development of the physical universe. And this reason that I want to give is commonly referred to as the cosmological argument. But to explain it, I, I want to actually show a video. It's put together by a powerful defender of the Christian faith, a guy named Dr. William Lane Craig and his ministry, Reasonable Faith. I think it does a great job kind of presenting this argument. So check out this video. Does God exist? Or is the material universe all that is, or ever was, or ever will be? One approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument. It goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. 
Is the first premise true? Let's consider. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin? Or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy. And that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models fail to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin, prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist. Let me just quickly highlight the three points of that video. The first was whatever begins to exist has a cause. Things don't just pop into existence without a cause, right? Science itself operates on this principle that every event requires a cause. Now, an objection that sometimes comes up is, well, if everything needs a cause, then who caused or what caused? God. But that's kind of a misunderstanding of the argument itself. It does not say that everything needs a cause. It only says that everything that has a beginning needs a cause. And since God is eternal, had no beginning, God does not need a cause, nor does he have a cause for his existence. The second point of that was that the universe began to exist. The universe began to exist. And almost the entire scientific community acknowledges this fact, that the universe it came into existence long ago. Now, many in the scientific community refer to this as what? The Big Bang, right? And, and the initial reaction of some Christians to this idea is, is negative. They say, well, I don't believe in a Big Bang. I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. But why does this need to be an either-or situation? What if science is simply pointing to the very same event described at the beginning of the book of Genesis? That's exactly what many Christian scholars believe, and it, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I'm not talking about every detail of their theory lining up, but what I'm saying is, 
What if science and the creation account in the book of Genesis are talking about the same starting point? So we've seen that whatever begins to exist, that has to have a cause, that the universe began to exist, and that leads us to this necessary conclusion, that therefore the universe has a cause. And even the Big Bang Theory itself calls for a cause outside of the physical universe. And as the video stated, this cause has to be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and unimaginably powerful. That sure sounds like the God I worship, doesn't it? So from a Christian point of view, the Big Bang sounds like a very compelling scientific description of the biblical doctrine theologians have proclaimed for centuries. They call it creation ex nihilo. And this, this literally means creation out of nothing. Again, the very first words of the Bible tell us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's why, as we learned in this video, Einstein and many other thinkers initially resisted this argument. They didn't like the theological implications that came, came with it because it gave too much support to the idea of a God who started it all. But I think we ought to follow the facts where they lead us. Those facts lead us to God. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So we, we see in spite of what many people say, science is not at odds with belief in God. Instead, science actually provides compelling evidence for God's existence. Let me look at, let's look at another science-related uh, reason that directs us to God. Number two, the fine-tuning in the universe points us to God as its intelligent fine-tuner. So imagine for a moment that you're on vacation in South Dakota, and you're taking a hike, and uh, you round a bend and come into a clearing, and in front of you, you see this image, Mount Rushmore, Right? Now imagine you've never seen a picture of this before. You don't have any clue about American history. You just happen to stumble upon this mountain, right? Are you going to really, tell me you're really going to look at this and think, wow, look at this natural phenomenon, right? Like, oh, the, the hailstorms and the lightning strikes and the millions of years of erosion that must have taken place for this to form. Is that what you're going to think? No, such precision and design and fine-tuning point back to a designer. Design requires a designer. And science is continually showing us that there are these laws and constants that were dialed in from the very beginning. There were a number of variables that, within the very structure of the universe that had to be set exactly the way they are in order for life to actually exist. In fact, scientists have discovered about 50 of these constants that had to be just, just so, just so, in order for life to be possible anywhere in the universe. So I want to give you kind of a couple examples, but bear with me. One of them is very technical. So physicists have discovered that, that there are four forces in nature, and they've calculated that the strength of each of these forces must fall within a very, very specific range where there could be no conscious life possible. For example, if the force of gravity were to change, just gravity, were to change by one part in 10,000 billion, billion, billion relative to the total range of the strengths of the four forces in nature, then conscious life, it would be virtually impossible anywhere in the universe. That tiny little shift, and there's no life. When Lee, Lee Strobel was writing his book called The Case for a Creator, which I would highly recommend, he interviewed an expert in these matters named Dr. Robin Collins. And Collins was then talking about something known as dark energy. And in his conversation about the precision of the universe, he illustrated things in this way. He said, let's say that you were out in space and you took a dart and you just randomly threw it at the earth. It would be like successfully hitting a bullseye that was one trillionth of a trillionth of an inch in diameter. That's less than the size of a one solitary atom. If the odds are that small for just this one area to be so precisely tuned to support life, imagine how small the odds become when you add in all the other factors that have to be just so finely tuned to a razor's edge precision. And they all have to come together. Is that really random? The chances become so small that Lee Strobel likes to say this. He says, by comparison, 
It makes the lottery look like a sure bet, right? Think about it this way. When my middle daughter, Anna, she's 14 now, but when she was three years old, she knew how to write her letters. She didn't know how to read yet, but she could write all of her letters. And so sometimes she would write some letters and and she knew how to spell a few words like cat and things like that. But sometimes she would just randomly write down letters and she would say, Daddy, what does this spell? (laughs) And, And it usually didn't spell anything. Occasionally she'd spell something like cow or dog. Once in a great while, she'd spell a four letter word, not a cuss word. Sarah would teach her those later. But, um, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, but she would just randomly write these letters and say, Daddy, what does that say? What if she started writing down these letters at a, as a three-year-old randomly, and she wrote them down for about an hour a day for several months, and what if she came to me one day and said, Daddy, what does it say? And I looked at it, and it was one of Shakespeare's greatest works. Well, that's pretty insane, right? Shakespeare is one of the greatest authors of all time. His words are just so incredibly thought out. It would be insane for a three-year-old to just randomly put down letters on a page and they become this understandable sentence, let alone an amazing work of literature. But that's exactly what naturalists say about our universe, that just randomly... Amazing natural events happened over and over and over, and it took chaos, and it made it into this insanely complex universe and system that is so precisely sufficient to sustain life that we have today. Oh, and and, and somehow it made something that was non-living become living, right? And Christians are the ones who are, are making giant leaps of faith here. I would argue that it takes a lot more faith to believe their argument than it does to believe that an almighty God who exists outside of the realm of time and space created the universe. In fact, another book I would highly recommend is by a man named Frank Turek, and I love the title of it. The title is, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. So the argument stands, the the amazing convergences of the many examples of fine-tuning in the universe, each independently set to the precise measures necessary to support life, they point powerfully to the existence of an astonishingly intelligent designer who made it all just so and just for us. Isaiah 40 puts it this way, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. He's saying, look around. Who created all these? Because it had to be a creator. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and his mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Let's look at a third argument. And this one delves a little bit more into philosophy. Our sense of morality points us to God as our moral lawgiver. Our sense of morality points to a God as a moral lawgiver. Think about this. Each of us has this, this moral internal standard or this internal standard of morality. And it seems like it's one that comes from above us and outside of us. But why would I say that the source of our morality is above and outside of us? Well, it's because everybody has it. Yet nobody consistently lives up to it. And, and here's a question you might want to ask. Why would, why would then, why would each of us invent a moral code that we could never quite fulfill and then use it to frustrate and condemn ourselves for the rest of our lives? Well, it's because we didn't invent it. And we can't get rid of it. It's, it's part of what it means to be human. The Bible describes this as our conscience. C.S. Lewis said in the book, Mere Christianity, he said, whenever you find a man who says he does not believe in a real right and wrong, you'll find that same man going back on this a moment later. He may break, break his promise to you, but if you try breaking one to him, he will complain, it's not fair. But of course, he doesn't believe in a real right and wrong, right? And he says, have they not let the cat out of the bag and shown that whatever they say, they really know the law of nature just like anyone else? that there is ingrained in us the sense of morality. You see, morality comes from a moral lawgiver. And some may argue that that this moral sense that we have is instilled in us by the culture that we live in, and that may be partially true, but certain aspects of our moral understanding, they go far beyond just culture. On this 20th anniversary of of weekend of 9-11, why is it 
that we intuitively and universally judged as wrong the actions of Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. We, we knew what they did was wrong, period. No question about it. Where did the, we get this sense, this universal sense of right and wrong then? If we didn't invent it, if it transcends the realm of culture and pol politics, if it's something that we just can't get away from, then what is its source? Could it be that a moral lawgiver actually knit these moral standards and the ability to understand and operate by them into the very fabric of what it means to be human? This conclusion certainly squares away with logic and experience, but it also lines up with what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul said in, in Romans 2, he said, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. It's like it's been ingrained in us. Their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. He's saying it's, it's there. This, this sense of morality is there inside of each person. The moral argument, I think, is summed up really well by Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for Faith. He said, without God, morality is, is simply the product of sociobiological evolution. And it's basically a question of taste or personal preference. Meaning, well, I can just make up what's right or wrong. So he says, without God, there's no absolute right and wrong that imposes itself on our conscience. He says, but we do know deep down that objective moral values do exist. Some actions like rape and child torture, for example, are universal moral abominations. And therefore, this means God exists. And we could say a whole lot more about this. And, and there are a lot of other arguments we could make. But just from these three arguments alone, we are pointed strongly towards the existence of God. One who started this immense universe. A God who fine-tuned the universe to extreme precision so that it could support life, including your life and mine. And a God who created us as humans with a universal and inescapable sense of morality. The evidence for God is strong and it is convincing and I'm hoping today you can walk out of here with, with, with the confidence that God really does exist and that he loves you and he wants you to know him and follow him. But there's one more reason I want to give to help you be assured that God exists. And that's this, that our personal experience points to a God who is worthy of our worship. So we've looked at some pretty heady evidence today. Some of you are like, I didn't realize I was going to need my science textbook today. Uh, so thanks for sticking with me on this. I, I know I've gone through a whole lot. But there's a per more personal response. There's a more personal response that we as followers of Christ can give to others when they're asking why we believe in God. We can look them in the eye and say, how do I know that God exists? Because he changed my life when I put my trust in him. Uh, he leads me in making decisions. I know he exists because I spend time with him. He intervenes in my life. And genuine experience is difficult to dismiss. In John chapter 9, there was a blind man who was healed by Jesus, given his sight back. And this man didn't know much about theology or philosophy or science, yet he was able to boldly tell the people, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I want a powerful testimony to everyone who heard it. And so, if you are a Christian, talking about God's activity in your life can be an important part of your answer to people who ask you how you know God exists. Science, philosophy, experience all point to the existence of an invisible God, the one who fits the description that the Bible gives us. He is the God who creates the God who loves, he is the God who is worthy of our worship. And if you are a Christian, you can stand firm on these truths. If you're not a Christian, I urge you to seriously look into them. And I urge you to follow the evidence wherever it leads, because I am confident it will lead you to belief in God. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have signed your name to your work of art. 
that your fingerprints are all over creation, that your autograph is everywhere we look. We can open our eyes and see from creation that this isn't some random happening, but that there is a God who has designed this and created this. We can know that there is a God by, by looking into ourselves and and seeing that we have this sense of there's, there's a right and a wrong. And someone put that into us. You have put that into us. We can look to the sciences and, and they keep pointing back to there. There was a beginning to this universe and it needed something to start it. Something outside the realm of time and space. Something powerful. Someone powerful. And you are that one God. You are powerful, almighty, creative, and also loving and gracious and merciful. So God, if we believe in you, and I pray that we would answer this question for ourselves, what do we do with that belief? I pray that it would change our lives. And I pray today that we would be just a little bit more confident in sharing about you and sharing how you've changed our lives, that we would be able to give a reason for the hope that we have and do it with gentleness and respect, that we would be more and more confident to go from here and make disciples. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.